Hey, what's up guys? My name is Marcus and today I want to talk to you about God's judgment. Now, I want you to think about that question for a moment and ask yourself, what is it that comes to mind when you think of God's judgment? For a lot of us, it's not good things. There's a lot of baggage and negative emotion associated with the idea of Christianity and judgment and God. For a lot of people, that whole idea has been used in sort of a tyrannical, controlling way, as a way of making you afraid and maybe increasing your ability or willingness to comply with the set standards that your community of faith has imposed on you. Or maybe there's someone in your life, it could be a parent or it could be a, an authority figure that has used the judgment of God as a way to control you, control your emotions, control your independence. So the idea of God's judgment isn't necessarily an idea that a lot of us find a lot of enthusiastic connection to. You know, maybe you are a member of the LGBTIQ plus community and this idea has been used to ostracize you. Or maybe you grew up in a church and the judgment of God was used to discredit you or push you to the side when you decided to do things a little bit differently or ask questions people weren't comfortable with. Whatever the experience might be, I think a lot of us can agree that the whole concept of the judgment of God is not one that we generally find pleasant, enjoyable, or agreeable. However, judgment isn't all bad. And I want to focus on that today and talk a little bit about that today because the fact of the matter is we love judgment as human beings. It's part of what makes us who we are and it's impossible to wiggle out of it or get rid of it forever. For example, right now in America, many people are crying out for justice on behalf of Ahmaud Arbery. Like here's this guy who's gone out for a jog, he's minding his own business and he gets gunned down by a father and a son who think he's connected to a robbery. And most people are like, yeah, it's definitely got to do with his race. And so there's a, there's a, there's a sort of a collective outcry saying we want justice for Ahmad. We want justice for what was done there, for, for, for the racism that was at play, for the violence and the uncalled for aggression and prejudice that was at play in that whole scenario. And it's rightly so, because there is something instinctive inside of us, right? Something deep inside that we know, even though people misuse judgment and mischaracterize it and abuse it, we still know instinctively that judgment is the thing that can set everything else right. It's, it's as if the universe is in chaos and pandemonium and judgment is the thing that can bring it back to rhythm and harmony. And so when God judges in scripture, his judgment is the kind of judgment that brings harmony out of disharmony. It brings rhythm out of chaos. Now, maybe you've never heard it put that way because maybe judgment has been used to add chaos to your life. But I want to explore a story in scripture today with each of you that I think really, really illustrates what judgment is like from a biblical perspective. So not, not a church perspective, not an evangelical perspective, not, none of that, right? We're just going to look at the story and let it speak for itself. And the story is found in one of Jesus' biographies, a book called the book of John. Now I've got some of the notes here on my phone, so I'm just gonna look through them as I go to make sure I don't miss anything important. But if you have a Bible with you, or if you just wanna hop on Google and look this up, it's in the book of John, and it's chapter eight, verses one through 11. So if you just look up John chapter eight, and you start from the top with me, you'll be able to follow along. Now here's how the story begins. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. 
All right, now I want your imagination to just sort of wrap itself around in that whole scenario. Jesus is teaching, the religious people turn up, and they have this woman who had been caught in the act of adultery, and they've got her kind of captive, and they bring her to Jesus. Now let's get something uh, like clear right off the bat here. Jesus and the religious people did not get along, like at all. So that ought to tell you something from the get-go because this isn't just true way back in Palestine in the year, you know, whatever, whatever AD. This is true even today. Jesus is unsafe when it comes to religious establishment and institution. He challenges the status quo. He makes us religious folk uncomfortable. There's something about Jesus that just doesn't fit in with this hyper-strict, organized, formulaic approach to faith. And so Jesus and the religious people, they were always clashing with each other. And so what this tells us right off the bat is that Jesus may not necessarily be reflected best in church. And Jesus said when he was on the earth, he said, look, if you see me, you've seen the Father, right? Jesus was the express image, the representation, God with skin on. And so if church isn't a proper representation of Jesus, then it's probably safe to assume that many times church isn't a proper representation of God altogether. So when you want to get to know who Jesus is, when you want to get to know who God is, when you want to wrap your head around what is God's judgment really about, then you got to look at Jesus because Jesus is the revelation of who God is. Not your church, not your pastor, not your father, not your mother, not the, you know, guy with the, the professor with all the theology degrees. No, Jesus is the representation of who God is. And Jesus irritated the religious people. He threatened tradition. He threatened their order, their ideology. He threatened the preachers and teachers of his day because the God Jesus represented was an affront to everything that they stood for. So I want to get this really clear off the bat because we're asking like, all right, what is God's judgment like? What are we talking about when we talk about God's judgment? Well, I want you to take your experience that maybe you've had in your religious past or in your church past and recognize that that experience shouldn't color what we're about to explore. Let Jesus introduce himself brand new through this story. So we get to verse four, and here's what it says. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this is a religious folk, right? They, they've arrived in the stories. They said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? <laughs> oh, you gotta love this, man. See, what these religious guys are doing is they're trying to set a trap for Jesus. Because this is during the Roman occupation of Israel, which means that the Israelites could not execute someone without getting permission from Rome. They weren't allowed to use, you know, the lethal injection, so to speak, you know, the, the sort of governmental um, execution. It was, it was something that was controlled by Rome because Israel was not sovereign. It was under foreign oppression. And so if Jesus said, yeah, Moses said stone her, so stone her, then the religious leaders could have gone to the Romans and said, hey, there's this guy running around who's saying, you know, you can stone people and that's an affront to Rome, so go arrest this guy. But if Jesus said, no, don't stone her, then the religious leaders could go to all the people and say, this guy contradicts our Bible. So either way, Jesus was going to lose. There was no way that he could wiggle out of this. At least that's what they thought. He was between a, a rock and a hard place. It was a lose-lose situation. So they said to him, they brought this woman, hey, we caught her in the act of adultery. Moses says to stone her, what do you say? Knowing that either way he replied, they could get him. So it was a trap that they were setting. Now let's go to verse six. They were trying to trap him. See, it says it in the story. I didn't make that up, right? I'm not that smart. But look at verse six. They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. 
But then something amazing happens. Notice what it says. It says, but Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. Now, let's pause there because I want you to notice what's happening here. Like, let your imagination just sort of wrap itself around this narrative. You've got, you've got Jesus. You've got the religious people. And they're basically accusers. And you've got the woman who is an accused. So what you have now in this story is you basically have a courtroom scene. You have the accusers, the prosecutors, you have the accused, the defendant, and you have the person whom they have approached for judgment. That's Jesus. So now Jesus is the one who is responsible for executing judgment in this courtroom scenario. And so this is why I said, you know, this is a really good story that illustrates how God judges. And I, and I want you to pay really close attention here because we're about to see exactly how God executes his judgment. And maybe that can help us get a better grasp of what God's judgment is, that it's not what maybe our church taught us it was. And it's not what maybe people, religious people in our lives have made it out to be. So let's keep going, right? There's this courtroom scene. And, and so this basically becomes an archetype of, of God's judgment. And, and so Jesus, he doesn't even respond to the accusers. Instead, he gets down on the ground and he starts to write in the dust. Now, the text never tells us what he wrote. It's kind of annoying because you, you would imagine, hey, you know, John, you know, what was he writing? It would be nice to know the juicy <laughs> details. But the text never actually tells us what Jesus wrote. Instead, it simply says he wrote on the ground with his finger. Now, we piece the pieces together. We kind of gather that most likely what Jesus was writing on the dust was the sins, the moral failures of the prosecutors. But remember that these men represent the religious establishment. So Jesus is not only pointing his finger at their individual moral failures, but he's He's writing down, he's exposing on the dust, he's exposing the moral failure of the religious establishment. He's exposing the moral bankruptcy of the prosecutors. In judgment, Jesus is raging against the established and expected order. In judgment, Jesus is speaking truth to power. He's not even using words. He's just on the ground writing on the dust. And so he gets down on the ground, he writes on the dust, and unveils in that act the cleverly hidden corruption of the institutional and socially contracted ideas of the day. Now let's get to verse 7. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned, throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. So notice what happens next. The religious grow impatient, and so they want an answer from Jesus, so he responds. But, but notice what he says. He says, whoever has not sinned, you can throw the first stone. And he goes back down and he keeps writing. And so this is where, you know, we, we kind of get the idea that most likely he, he's writing their sins on the ground. You know? He gets down, he keeps writing. And nobody steps forward. Not a single one of the prosecutors is willing to step forward and execute judgment. Because at that moment, they're all confronted with the fact that they should be stoned as well. See, one of the things that this story has taught me for a long time is who am I to judge? I mean, who are you to judge? We're all messed up. We're all broken. We've all had moral lapses. Sometimes, they're banal and sometimes they're catastrophic. We've all hurt others and robbed from others, whether physically or emotionally. 
We, we've all contributed to the perpetuation of suffering and injustice in this world, whether in really tiny microcosmic ways or in bigger, more systemic ways. We've all contributed to the pattern of brokenness in the empire. And so the question then is, who am I? to judge others. And, and there's something really powerful in that, right? There's something really powerful in that because I want you to think about it. Like, forget about God judging you, right? Forget about God's law and God's standard. For, forget about all that. If you were judged based on your own expectations of other people, you would find plenty there to condemn you. Let me, let me say that again so that it's really clear. Forget about God and his judgment. If you judged yourself based on what you demand from other people, you would find that nine times out of 10, you fail just as much as everybody else does. And we're not talking about some ethereal external standard. I'm talking about your own standard, your own demands for authenticity, your own demands for honesty, your own demands for, you know, non-hypocrisy, if that's even a word, like your own demands that you place on others, if you were to measure your life via your own demands, you'll find you can't even meet your own. So then who are you to judge? Who am I? The things that I expect of others, I fail at myself. And there's a very liberating aspect to this whole idea because what it's essentially saying is it, it sets you free from being the judge and the jury and the executioner, the prosecutor over other people's lives. You can let it go because guess what? We're all messed up. We're all broken. Now, that doesn't mean that you are not allowed or expected to rage against injustice when you see it. But it certainly sets us free from being prosecutors over other people's lives. All of the religious people leave. They're gone. But there's something else that's happening here. Look at verse 9. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Now notice this. Nobody throws the stone. Nobody. Like, everybody leaves. But, but I, I want you to think back. And, and look a little bit, look again from a bird's eye view as what's transpiring in the story because Jesus is basically saying, look, whoever has not sinned, throw the first stone. And, you know, the first religious guy, Pharisee, is like, oh, well, that counts me out. And he goes, and then the second one, oh, that counts me out. And, and one by one by one, they're all gone. And now the only thing that's left in this whole scene is Jesus and the woman. That's it. There's nobody else left. Everybody's gone. And here's the brilliancy of this story, the way, it's, the way it's orchestrated, the way it's engineered. It is engineered to point out one overwhelming powerful reality that we generally assume when we read the story, there was nobody in the crowd. There was nobody in this scenario who was without sin. But actually, there was one. And it was Jesus himself. He was without sin, which meant by his own admission, he was the only one in the crowd who had the capacity, the moral capacity to throw the first stone. And yet he doesn't. He doesn't throw the stone. Instead, what does he do? Verse 10, then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Did not even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. It's one thing for someone who is as morally repugnant as I am to say, look, I don't judge you either. But when the perfect God of the universe says, look, I don't condemn you either. It's like, what? But you're perfect. You don't have this record of moral failure. Why would you not throw stone? I mean, you got every right to do it, and yet God doesn't do it. And so this, you know, like, I just want to emphasize one point here real quick before we wrap up, because I'm about to wrap up now. I just want to emphasize one point here real quick. It's like so many of us run away from God because the church was mean to us, and it's like, come on. 
Of course the church was mean. The church is always mean. Not everybody. I don't, I don't want to overstate it and be theatrical. There's beautiful people there too. But of course, of course it happens. This, this, you know, there's jerks everywhere, guys. Come on. But, but the point that I want to point out is like Jesus himself, God himself is like, I don't condemn you. Like that's the only thing that matters. It's what he thinks. And, and he looks at this woman who clearly did the wrong, by the way. He looks at this woman who clearly did the wrong. And he's like, look, I don't condemn you either. Something interesting about God's judgment that we've missed when the very perfect God of the universe is willing to look an adulteress in the eye and say, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. And now the go and sin no more is predicated not on religious or ethical demand, but is predicated on an environment of acceptance. It is in the acceptance, in the embrace of God, that the woman can now go forward and change her life. She can now move forward and become her best possible self, not because there is an oppressive, tyrannical, religious overlord who is demanding and exacting a structure and order for her life that she better comply with or else she's gonna burn in hell. No, that's not what we see here at all. What we see is the opposite. It's in a realm, in, in an environment, in a milieu of acceptance that Jesus then releases the woman from the oppression of her own moral failures. And she can now become a new creature. She can now advance and become her best possible self because she has been liberated through acceptance. I mean, that's just awesome. It's powerful. And that's judgment. But anyways, look, I can go forever and ever and ever, and I'm not allowed to. Project Atlas was like, guys, keep it short. So I'm going to wrap this up, all right? There are three things that happen in this story that I want to point out. When we talk about God's judgment, here are the three things that are happening. Number one, God judged. All right? Now, let me explain that. In his judgment, what God did in this story is he exposed the injustice of the establishment. Not true religion but false religion. And they are, they are, there is a distinction, right? There's true religion and there's false religion. And, and, and Jesus exposes the kind of religion that's more interested in power than people and it's more interested in, in rules than in relationships. Jesus exposes them and he's writing on the sand. He exposes the moral bankruptcy of the establishment. And so what this shows us is that God's judgment, God's judgment, Listen to this. God's judgment is an act of social and humanitarian justice because it exposes and demolishes the institutional social structures that attempt to exploit our shame and brokenness for their own agenda. And this is what Jesus was doing as he's writing on his hand. He's deconstructing the social conventions of the day. Social conventions that have been forcefully placed there by rigid religion. And he also, in his act of judgment, he also dismantles the political agenda of the holier than thou and sends them running with their tails between their legs. It's awesome, it's awesome. And if we ever want this world to be the beautiful place we know it can be, we need God to judge. We need God to expose the hidden, cleverly disguised injustice embedded into the very substructures of our establishments and our governments and our churches. We need him to do it. We can't do it. We don't even, we, we, we don't have the capacity to even see half of it, but we need him to do it. Number two, God understood. And here's a beauty here that is a nuance when it comes to judgment that many Christians often miss. God, in this, in this particular story, we're talking about Jesus in human flesh. He didn't come out and condemn the woman. He didn't go, hey, you committed an act of sin and, you know, none of that. There's, he knew he, she had done it. There was no argument there. She wasn't denied. Nobody was denying it. But instead, what we see God doing is he manifests his judgment in harmony with the many variables that are at play in this woman's life. For example... If what she did was so bad, where is the guy? Right? Where is the man who was also caught in adultery? They're both supposed to be stoned, not just her. So there's a variable in the story. 
Um, why is she the only one being accused? And so Jesus looks at her and he sees her error, but he also sees the context. He sees that there's a scheme at play here. He sees that this woman was most likely set up. He sees that there is most likely a social structure at play in his environment, a social structure that looks at women like this woman who had probably made mistakes in her past already and does not allow them to recover. And Jesus understands that. He understands that the woman occupies a space in time and culture where had she made a moral error in the past, she could never undo it. She would never be allowed to move on. She would never be allowed to advance. No man would ever take her for a husband. The social stigma would be so strong that there would be virtually no hope for her to move beyond her mistakes. Jesus also understood the religious centric and political scheme at play. As I mentioned, this woman had most likely been set up. In, in short, and I gotta, I, gotta, I gotta cut this short, the point that I'm making is God doesn't just look at your moral failures. He reasons and balances your life out by taking into account and understanding the impact of your environment and your society and your context. This never excuses selfish acts, but it puts them into perspective. And God does that. In other words, God's judgment is not blind. It's filled with understanding. And finally, point number three, God restored. And here's the main point that I wanted to get. Like the judgment of God is not like focused on being penal, right? That's not its primary objective. That's not what it's aiming for. It's not, that's not what it takes joy or delight in. Its primary purpose is not to make examples of people or to condemn or to punish. God's judgment, the primary purpose of God's judgment is to restore, to restore harmony, to restore rhythm, to restore oneness. The harmony, the rhythm, and the oneness that is broken and shattered by selfishness and oppression and tyranny, God's judgment undoes those substructures and restores the universe back to one pulse of harmony. And so God's judgment isn't really about destroying, it's about restoring. And this is why he says to the woman, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. What Jesus is doing in those few statements is he is restoring. He's telling the woman, look, you're not trapped. The social stigmas of the day might tell you you can't move past this, but I'm telling you, you can move past it. I know you don't want to live this life and you feel forced to live this life because nobody will give you a second chance. I'm giving you a second chance. You don't have to stay stuck in what people say you have to stay stuck in. You don't have to live in their box. I'm setting you free. And so the judgment of God is a judgment of restoration. He's calling her to a higher state of being. He's calling her to the development of her best possible self, grounded not in religious shame and, and, and fear, as we've already talked, but grounded in acceptance and safety and, and forgiveness. It's as if the woman is a flower who has now been placed in good soil and now she can grow. It's restoration, man. It's acceptance. When we are safe in God's arms, we can grow. We can become new people. We can achieve greater heights. Now this leads me to my final point. God healed. We're talking about judgment here. God healed. He healed the woman by offering her something religion had never offered her. A new beginning grounded in an old truth that God loved her. So, God's judgment isn't what a lot of us think it is. It's not blind and authoritarian condemnation. To the contrary, it's healing. It's restoration. And God is soon, before Jesus returns, God is going to judge this world. So what does that mean? That means God is going to deconstruct and dismantle and annihilate all the systems of oppression and tyranny and injustice. He's going to expose them 
for the charlatans that they are. And then he's going to heal. And he's going to restore. And he's going to put the universe back into rhythm. Back into oneness. Back into harmony with love. And the real question that we have to wrestle with today is not whether or not God's judgment is good or not. God's judgment is good. God's judgment is the ultimate act of social and humanitarian restoration. The ultimate question that we have to wrestle with is a little bit different. It's this. When that judgment begins, will you trust him? Will you say, God, I know you're judging this world, and I know you're deconstructing the systems of injustice. Now, I've been a part of those systems. I've perpetuated the, the, the brokenness that we see, maybe not in big ways, but at least in little ways. I, I've been a part of it, God. So here's what I want. I, I want to throw myself at your mercy. I want to trust in you. And here's my prayer. God, please judge me. Judge me. That's a strange question, right? Not the kind of thing we normally want to ask. But when we're connected with God, when we've developed a trusting relationship with God through Jesus, judgment becomes something beautiful. It's no longer something to be afraid of. It's something to celebrate. Because God is restoring and healing and he understands you, and he loves you, and he's saying, hey, I don't condemn you either. You can be better. And he's saying, hey, I don't condemn you either. Instead, I'm calling you to be your best possible self in an environment of acceptance and love that sets you free. And I wanna invite you to think about that today. I wanna invite you to wrestle with that a little bit. And consider that even though people in your life might have misused God's judgment against you, that his judgment is actually one of the most beautiful things that our universe could ever experience. Now, as I close uh, this message, I want to invite you to also consider giving. Not to me, not to Project Atlas, or not after money. I'm thinking of Amnesty International. Amnesty International is a justice movement that is involved in lots of different spaces. And one of the spaces in which they're involved in is bringing justice to those who have been wrongfully accused, those who are imprisoned in diverse countries around the world uh, with no justice, with, with no investigation, just thrown in prison, their lives completely disrupted. All the links are gonna be below. And if you feel like, hey, I want to be a part of giving back to justice. I want to be a part of manifesting what God's judgment is like in a real tangible way through my own life. This is a really nice place to start. So check out the links below, Amnesty International, specifically dealing with the cases of the wrongfully accused. It's a beautiful way to help bring a little bit more healing and justice to our world. Take care, guys. God bless you.